Hello, welcome to our introduction to evolution. This topic is going to be the foundation we build the majority of our course on. We're going to view zoology and the rise of animals and their diversification through the lens of adaptations and slow change over time, which at its heart is what evolution is. This lecture is gonna be broken into two halves. This first half is going to lay some of the groundwork for you to understand the actual processes that drive evolutionary change. And then after we've got those basic principles down, we're gonna start talking about how evolution really happens in the real world. All right, there's some terminology that we need to get out of the way first. I'm big on defining terms to make sure that we are all understanding what we mean when we use some very specific language in science. The very first term we need to define is the word species. Species is formally defined, formally defined as the smallest unit of biological classification. Now, what does that mean? It means when we say the word species, what we're really saying is we're, this is a specific, unique group of animals that have almost all the same traits and are all each other's closest relatives when compared to the rest of animal life. What we call biological classification is just an organizational system that we humans came up with to try to understand the huge diversity we see in the world around us. We like to organize things. That's how our brains work. Keep in mind the classification system I'm about to show you. We made it up. It doesn't exist in nature. It's a set of definitions of categories that we created to try to better understand the relationships between living things. What that means is the natural world isn't always going to fit cleanly into these classification boxes. Classification is messy. Nature doesn't necessarily abide by our rules. So there are gonna be times where this classification system, which will come up over and over again in our class, is gonna fail us. It'll let us down. There will be organisms that don't necessarily fit cleanly into one group or another. And that's part of the beauty of the natural world is it is super complex. So here's how our uh, classification system works. We're gonna talk about this in a lot more detail in our actual classification lecture. But for now, just take a look at this diagram. You'll see that at the top, we have a very large category called a domain. Domains are the largest grouping of organisms you can have. In fact, every living thing on the planet belongs to one of three different domains. Domain Eukarya, Domain Archaea, and Domain Bacteria. And we'll talk about what those mean in the classification lecture. But for now, know that every living thing on the planet, from bacteria to plants to fungus to animals, falls into one of those three big categories. And each of those big categories, each of those domains, is broken down into smaller and smaller subgroups. Okay, Kind of like Russian nesting dolls. Those are those wooden dolls that have smaller versions of themselves inside. Okay? That's how this classification system works. We can take domain eukarya and we can break it down into smaller and smaller groups that have more and more uh, requirements to belong to each group. Okay? So for example, to be in domain eukarya, you just have to be a eukaryote. Being a eukaryote means you've got a nucleus in your cells. That's it, that's the only requirement. If you have a nucleus in your cells, you're good, you're in. You're part of domain eukarya. But we can split this domain into smaller groups called kingdoms. And each of these kingdoms has different requirements if you wanna to belong to it. Now to be in these kingdoms, you still have to be eukaryotic because all of the kingdoms are part of domain eukarya. If we choose kingdom animalia, since this is a zoology class, to belong to this kingdom, you have to be eukaryotic and your body has to be made up of more than one type of cell. That's what multicellular means. It means you've got lots of different types of cells doing different jobs. You also have to be heterotrophic. Hetero means other. Trophic means to feed. You're an other feeder. It means you have to feed on other organisms to get your energy. As animals, we eat either plants or other animals in order to get our nutrition and to get our energy needs met. 
If you have all three of these characteristics, eukaryotic, multicellular, and heterotrophic, you belong in kingdom animalia. We can keep going using this same sort of logic. Kingdom animalia can be broken down into a number of different phyla, which is the plural of phylum. Phylum chordata, for example, are all animals that have a backbone. If you've got a backbone and you're heterotrophic, multicellular, and eukaryotic, you belong in phylum chordata. See how this works? Okay. And you can see as we move down in these levels in our diagram, animals, or I should say organisms, keep dropping out. Up here, everything you see in this box belongs in domain eukarya. But when we focus in on just kingdom animalia, anything that's not an animal disappears. Okay. So no more plants, no more mushrooms. Those guys aren't animals, so they don't wind up in this box. Likewise, if we focus in on phylum chordata, anything that doesn't have a backbone disappears, which includes our worms and our insects. I think that's all. Yeah. And we can keep going and going. If we drop down into class mammalia, you can divide a phylum into many different classes. If we choose to focus on class mammalia within phylum chordata, we're going to be looking at animals that have sweat glands and that produce milk for their offspring. Anything that's not a mammal, for example, this reptile or this fish, they drop out and are no longer considered in our diagram. We can keep going and going, breaking classes down into orders, breaking that order down into families, breaking that family down into genera, which is the plural for this word, genus, until finally we get to the bottom of the list species. Species generally are defined as a single type of living thing. That seems like a straightforward definition. It's not. We have a hard time defining what it means to be a single type of living thing. What I'm going to spend the next couple slides doing is explaining why such a simple thing is actually so hard. Defining species is one of the most challenging things that we do in biological classification. The example I'm going to give you to try to clarify why this is, is Phydole barbata. Phydole barbata is the genus and species name of this group of ants, or I should say of ants that are in these pictures. So you tell me, do you think this is Phydole barbata? Is this Phydole barbata? Are those two ants totally different species? No. Not only are those two ants the same species, not only are both of these ants Phydole barbata, they're sisters. They actually share three quarters of their genes. These two ants come from the same queen, the same mother. They are full siblings. And yet, look how different they look. This big girl here, and she is a female, the ants that you see out and about doing work for the colony, foraging for food, raiding your kitchen, they generally are all female. This big girl, she's a soldier cast ant, means she does a lot of defense for the colony. And you can see she's really built for it. Her whole body structure is built to be strong and aggressive. This little girl down here, also these, these are all workers. Workers do the day-to-day -day tasks that are necessary to keep the colony alive. They forage for food, they do all the cleaning, they feed all the babies. They are small, agile, and quick because it helps them get their jobs done more efficiently. This is one of the biggest reasons why species defining is so hard. Looks are deceiving. Looks lie to you. They don't necessarily give you reliable information about relationships. Just because two groups of organisms look different from each other, it doesn't mean that they're not related. So using just physical appearance becomes unreliable if you're trying to identify which groups of organisms are each other's closest relatives which is what defining a species is really doing. 
There are currently 26 different species definitions that are being debated in the scientific literature. That's how challenging this is. You don't have to learn all 26. Instead, we're just going to focus in on the three that are most prominent. The first is the oldest definition of a species. It's called the morphological definition. Morpho means physical or appearance. So this is defining species based on how they look. It's the oldest definition for species because when we first started categorizing organisms into groups, it was back in Aristotle's time, right? So we're talking hundreds and hundreds of years ago, before the microscope, before knowledge of molecules or genetics. The only information that scientists had available to them was what they could observe, what they could see. So using the physical characteristics of animals was the easiest way to try to group them together and determine their relationships to each other. So this definition, which is still sometimes used, it's based on physical traits that are shared between individuals. If you share physical traits with another individual, you're probably related to them, according to this definition. The problem with this is what you saw on the previous slide with Fidoli Barbata. Minor genetic changes can cause major physical differences. You can have identical genes to another individual, meaning you've got identical DNA. But not all of your genes are necessarily turned on in all of your cells. You can be genetically identical to another individual, but if they have some genes that are active, which are inactive in you, those genes are going to change their physical appearance, and they're going to change their appearance in ways that don't match you any longer. Okay? This is called gene activation. Okay? Just because you have all the same genes as another individual doesn't mean all the same genes are going to be activated in both of your bodies. And since genes control your physical appearance, this can cause you to look very different from each other, even though genetically you are very closely related. Here's another example that I love, Regea Piscea. These are tube worms. Okay. These guys and these guys down here. It's a nice diagram of what they look like. These tube worms were first discovered along uh, the edges of hydrothermal vents, which are deep sea uh, underwater volcanoes, essentially. They spew caustic, boilingly hot water up in, onto the seafloor from beneath the Earth's, the Earth's crust. This is an incredibly hostile environment to live in. Temperatures around the hydrothermal vent are insanely high. The water tends to be incredibly caustic and damaging. This is a really difficult place to live, but unlike the rest of the deep sea, it's warm. So animals do tend to congregate there and adapt to that hostile environment. When we first started sampling some hydrothermal vent communities, we would just go down and collect examples of all the different animals we found there. We'd bring them back up to the surface, examine them, and try to determine what species they were. At first, we uh, collected both of these types of tube worms. And they're called tube worms because they're a worm that lives inside one of these calcified, hardened tubes. We thought we had two different species of tube worm. We thought we had a short, fat species, that's what they called it, up here. And then we thought we had a long, skinny species, which you see down here. Because they look different. One was short, had a very, very thick tubular shell, and uh, tended to be wide and stout. The other was more elongated and had a much thinner and more elegant shell. Well, we named them two different things, identified them as two different species, and then later, once their DNA was run and sequenced, we found that genetically the two groups were almost identical to each other. Genes were activated in the short, fat tube worms that were inactive in the long, skinny tube worms. And what caused this difference? depended on where the worm grew up. When these worms disperse as larvae, wherever they land, they attach themselves in place and they grow there and never leave again. So they choose a location, stick to it, and that's where they spend their lives. They grow up in that new environment. Baby tube worms, 
that landed near the edge of the hydrothermal vent had to deal with those extremely hot and extremely caustic conditions. So, genes in their DNA activated that allowed them to grow really thick, robust tube shells to protect them from the environment. The current was very strong as well, so they didn't grow very tall. They stayed short so they wouldn't be swept away. Tube worms that landed further away from the hydrothermal vent, where the water was cooler, where it was less caustic, the current wasn't as fast. They didn't need to be really tough in order to survive. Their environment was a lot gentler. So the genes that would have caused them to grow that thick shell and to grow short, those genes were never activated. They stayed inactive in this group of tube worms. So they grew longer and skinnier with a thinner shell. And yet the two groups genetically are almost identical. It's part of what makes the morphological definition so challenging. Now, the next definition we came up with as biologists to try to solve the problem with the morphological definition, its unreliability, was we said, okay, well, we know species, or I should say, we know animals that are closely related to each other are probably descended from the same ancestors. It means they can make babies with each other. They can reproduce and make more of themselves. So, the next definition of a species we started to use was called the biological definition. The biological definition states that if two animals can mate, reproduce, and produce viable, fertile offspring, meaning the offspring can survive, that's what viable means, and they can also make more of themselves, that's what fertile means, then your two original parents are both the same species. Okay. This, though, has its own problems. And those problems come in the form of this guy. This is a mule. Mules are a hybrid. Okay. They're the offspring of a donkey and a horse. Now, donkeys and horses are considered to be two different species, but they can reproduce. The trick is mules can't. Mules cannot reproduce. They can't make more of themselves. They can't have their own babies. They can have sex, but that sex doesn't result in fertilization or a baby being born. Okay? This is part of what holds up the biological definition of a species but it also complicates it a bit. This definition relies on something called reproductive isolation. Reproductive isolation is a critical concept here. You've got to understand what this means. There's two types of reproductive isolation you need to understand, physiological and behavioral. Think of reproductive isolation as being what keeps species distinct and separate from each other. It's what keeps them from blending their characteristics together and becoming the same group of organisms. Okay? There's two ways you could be reproductively isolated from another group. The first is physiological isolation. Physiological isolation is when you physically cannot create offspring together. There's two ways this can happen. The first is called prezygotic isolation. Prezygotic isolation prevents you from fertilizing an egg. So prezygotic isolation prevents fertilization. I'll give you examples too. All right, so a couple of ways this can happen. If you physically 
cannot have sex. Your reproductive organs don't fit together. Your bodies aren't arranged in the correct way for you to have intercourse. If you can't have sex, your sperm and egg can never come together and fertilize. So right there, you're not going to be able to reproduce. But let's say you can have sex. Your body parts match up well enough that you are able to, uh, to mate with each other. But your gametes don't recognize each other. So what are gametes? Gametes is the formal term we use for sperm and egg which are the cells that fuse together during fertilization. Sperm from the male, eggs from the female. So your gametes don't match, let's say. Or they're not compatible. If the sperm can't fertilize the egg, reproduction isn't going to happen. So Prezygotic isolation are physical factors that prevent that egg from being fertilized. Either you can't mate or the mating itself isn't successful. Now there's a second type of, of uh, physiological isolation. Postzygotic isolation prevents you from reproducing successfully, but it happens after the egg has already been fertilized. So you're able to mate, your sperm recognizes the egg, fertilization occurs, so now you've got a fertilized egg, but it fails to thrive, it fails to grow into a healthy, mature, fertile offspring. So what are examples of this? Well, spontaneous miscarriage. The egg starts to develop, but there are too many genetic incompatibilities between the father's DNA and the mother's DNA, so it can't develop proper, properly. Likewise, maybe the offspring develops, but after it's born, has a lot of physical malformations or physical problems and so it doesn't survive. It's not viable. So it dies young. The last one is maybe that offspring survives. Maybe it's healthy. It's able to grow into an adult. But the offspring itself is sterile meaning it cannot have its own babies. It can't reproduce more of itself. Now you'll notice both prezygotic and postzygotic isolation, the names share the same basic structure. Post or pre and zygote. A zygote is a fertilized egg. That's our formal name for a fertilized egg. Now the names hopefully make more sense. Postzygotic isolation is reproductive isolation after that zygote has formed. Prezygotic means isolation that prevents the zygote from forming, happens before. That is all physiological reproductive isolation. However, you can be reproductively isolated 
by other factors that have nothing to do with your physiology and everything to do with your behavior. Our second major category of reproductive isolation is behavioral isolation. Behavioral isolation is when your preferences, your mating habits, your foraging habits, your actual behaviors prevent you from mating with another individual. Okay? Your behaviors prevent mating. Okay? This is easier to explain using examples. Let's say you forage for food. Foraging is searching for food. Let's say you forage at different times. You forage for food in the morning. Your, po your possible mate forages for food in the evening. You guys are never going to interact with each other. If you don't interact, you're not going to mate. Be your activity time differs. Similar to the first one, but on a larger scale, let's say you just in general prefer to be active at night. So you're nocturnal, but the animal that you might potentially mate with likes to be active during the day. They're diurnal. Again, you're just never going to interact. Your very mating habits themselves might isolate you from other individuals. In fact, usually mating habits are designed to do just that. So if your mating habits differ, you won't recognize each other as potential mates. So a good example of this is actually on the previous slide. Meadowlarks are a very common bird in North America and they sing in order to attract a mate. The males sing. Okay. So these meadowlarks, you can see them over here. Okay. This is the western meadowlark. This is the eastern. They are physically almost identical. They have vast majority of the same physical structures, they're active at the same times of day, they even overlap in where they're found in the middle of the continent. So these guys could even interact with each other. The trick is, even though they look the same and they act the same, they never mate. And it's because males sing to attract females, but the song of the western meadowlark is different from the song of the eastern meadowlark. So the Western Meadowlark females don't recognize the Eastern male's songs, so they never mate. That's an example of a behavioral isolating factor. So this is, this is pretty good. This is pretty good. I mean, this goes a long way towards explaining how species could stay separate from each other. But the problem with this definition is that our hybrids, which are the offspring of two different species, they're supposed to be sterile. If your original parents are definitely different species. Sometimes they're not. You do sometimes get fertile hybrids. And if the, re if the biological definition of a species was totally correct, that wouldn't happen. Okay? So this definition also isn't perfect. Our third definition is also imperfect but it's the best we've come up with so far, and it's the one we're gonna use in class. It's called the phylogenetic definition, okay? Notice this keyword here, genetic. We are now gonna take genes into account. And what genes tell you isn't just how much you have in common with another individual. What genes actually tell you is your ancestry. All of your genes came from your parents. All of your parents' genes came from their grandparents. All your grandparents' genes came from your great-great-grandparents. So ultimately, all of your genes 
came from those great-great-grandparents as well. And you can trace that ancestry back hundreds or millions of generations. And if you trace how many other individuals who are alive with you today also share those ancestors, it'll give you a sense of how closely related you are to those other people. We use that same logic when we're looking at the relationships between animals. We compare their genetic compositions to each other, determine how many genes they have in common, and that gives us a sense of how far back they share an ancestor. The way we define a species using this information is, a species is the smallest set of organisms that all share an ancestor okay, and can be distinguished from other such sets. What that means is our set of organisms all share this ancestor, but no other organisms do. Right? Nobody else has this ancestor except for the individuals who are in our group. Those other groups have their own ancestors who aren't related to us. We're basing our groupings on ancestry. We use what look like family trees to visualize these relationships, just like you would have drawn a family tree when you were in elementary school, showing maybe you and your brother, and that you guys are both descended from your mom, and your mom's descended from your grandma, but your mom's also got a sister over here. Okay. That sort of family tree is, uses the same logic as our phylogenetic trees that we're going to be working with in class. On a phylogenetic tree, we say that species exist at the tips of the branches on the tree, meaning these guys, these terminal ends. Okay? On this little phylogenetic tree, we're looking at three different species of California salamander. We're going to talk more about how to work with these trees in the classification lecture, but for now, what you should know is that you can think of an ancestor for group A existing right here on the tree. These lines essentially summarize all of your ancestors. They represent all your ancestors. So this is an ancestor that species A is descended from, but species B isn't, right? Species B is over here. You have to follow this line in order to get to species B, and in nowhere on this line do we connect to that ancestor. Okay? This ancestor belongs just to species A. That's what makes species A unique. Occasionally, you will see what's called a ring species. Ring species are a single species, but they've got a huge amount of physical variation. Okay? This is an example of how morphology, physical appearance, can lie to you about relationships. All of these salamanders look very different from each other, but in fact, they're all each other's closest relatives. They're all the same species, even though they have a lot of physical variation. 